creating a character is one of the most important things you can do in Dungeons and Dragons. Ideally, this will be, character will be with you for years, traveling and changing and growing as it goes through all the triumphs and traumas of a campaign. Hello everyone, I'm Joshua Stringer, and today I'm going to be talking to you about making an in-depth and alive character for Dungeons and Dragons. Let's begin. When we first create a character, they can somewhat begin as an awkward blank slate. Depending on how much lead time we have into a campaign, we could end up with pages upon pages of backstory or a one-sentence idea as to what they're going to be. And this is fine. This works for differently for different people. Some people like having the big chunky backstories and having a very clear idea of everything about their character. Others uh, prefer to go off with just a basic idea and let the campaign shape them as a whole. But for some people, there are people out there who want to create more in-depth characters, but through whatever factors that there are struggle at this stage, be it through lack of uh, structure in the expanded part of creating a character, or be it the just general anxiety and overwhelmingness that there can be sometimes with creating an entire person from scratch. So for those of you in that boat who want to make an in-depth character but are lost in, on the how, allow me to offer some advice. One of the most daunting parts about making a character is the fact that you have this blank slate of which to make a person. In the real world, making an actual person doesn't always have to be this difficult. It happens on accident, and this does also happen with creating characters, but today we are looking at how to create them from scratch intentionally. When starting off, I tend to focus on just one thing, and that is what do I want to play? What do I want to be in this campaign? Because honestly, like I, there are a lot of people who are more than happy to fill in the blanks, to fill in whatever the party that currently exists needs to be an effective and balanced uh, team unit. But if I'm having to play this character for years, I want to make sure that I'm having fun playing this character because that is the most important part. And as a DM, I can tell you that if a party isn't balanced, that's fine because I decide what the balance is. I can re if there's a campaign that is all bards, then there's going to be a lot of social encounters and less big things that hit you very hard because that might not necessarily be something the party can deal with. Or I will throw them at you as a challenging boss encounter. But you don't need to worry, I feel. People get very caught up on what they should play rather than on what they want to play. And what you want to play, what you want to do, what's going to give you the most joy and make you have the most fun is what's most important in D&D for me. When I created my most long running PC for a campaign, my Paladin, Nyx Silkerin, it largely came off the back of, I had just had my first character death. My uh, gunslinger had uh, betrayed the party and as such had paid the price and was shot down in the street by a guard. But having been in this campaign now, we were level four and I'd got sort of an idea of what was most likely to appear. I sort of knew the kind of themes and styles that this campaign was going with. So with a lot of undead present, Paladin seemed a good fit. It also made sure that there was someone in the front line to be able to do the fighting, a tanky character, which was something I really wanted to play. This also had the added bonus of being a high charisma class and I'm someone who very much likes to talk in Dungeons and Dragons. I like playing high charisma because I like doing the talky talk. This is then what ended up feeding into her being an Arsimar based on why she was a paladin, what then led into the race choice of Arsimar. And with those two, the class and race picked, it was then an easy decision of what her background was because then it just tied especially well into her Arsimar heritage and why she became a paladin in the first place. And the background ended up being full hero. Now her personality came about because the rest of the party uh, were, we had a warlock, rogue and bard. Um, very sort of uh, brooding characters. I know Rowan who plays our rogue, Caleb, has said in the past that Caleb started off as evil aligned and has since shifted. And I could sort of see this very real possibility of it shifting into a very dark campaign and how these characters are very ready to be on this dark precipice. So I wanted to have a character who could serve as a counter to that, someone to be the, the beacon, the light, the hope, um, to get very uh confident about what Nyx is. So that's what Nyx became. They were very much helped by her being an Arsimar paladin and she's a literal beacon. Uh, very 
literal sense, but also this overwhelmingly positive person who, even through all the stuff she's been through since her creation, is still managing to be a, a being of overwhelming positivity and compassion who could be there to protect the PCs, not just from the monsters we got thrown at, but also themselves in a way, someone to help. I think that comes from a very like internal need to want to help everyone and this is always a thing that will come up in character creation of Dungeons and Dragons, there will always be bits of yourself in that. And how much you want to explore those, how much you want to dig at that is down to you, but there will always be a little bit of you in any kind of bit of acting you do. Now what this shows is there are several ways that you can get inspiration on what kind of character you want to be. There are undoubtedly literally dozens of quizzes out there that can give you your alignment, your race, your class for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I've, I've done them myself and they can be very long sometimes or very short and there's been this whole recent increase in uh, U-Quiz quizzes out there as I'm sure you've all seen. The thing I tend to focus on first is class because that's what kind of comes out most and is kind of where you need to start most on your character sheet because that is what's all your stats are dependent on and all that kind of stuff, but you can start really anywhere you want to. Think of it like this. Think of, in terms of questions and the quizzes of what you want to do. If you are stuck about what you want to do, think this. You want to be a melee fighter or a ranged fighter? Magic or no magic? Strength or dex? Intelligence, wisdom, charisma, or none of the above. Looking at all these answers and questions there, being like, okay, which, which ones do I prefer? Do I want to be smart? Do I want to be wise? Do I want to be charismatic? Do I want to be none of those things? Do you want magic or just like, mundane grit and uh, spit going on. Just these uh, questions can give you a very good sense of what kind of character you want to play. For example, if you picked a melee fighter focusing on strength magic with high intelligence, then congratulations, the Eldritch Knight fighter archetype might be the one for you. But this is something that you'll then have to go research, see if it is something you want to play, but this is very good jumping off point, a springboard for you to find out what it is you want to be. Your character's race can be another great starting off point. I know a lot of people who tend to default to uh, certain races, elves and tieflings being a common one, but, but where your character is from, who their people are, can inform so much about them and who they are. And this is especially prevalent in homebrew worlds. My first homebrew world is very different from established wizards canon in terms of what that means, the histories of the peoples of this world. And it meant that certain races, in fact all races, humans, orcs, dwarves, gnomes, elves, dragonborn, tieflings, all come with a very specific and unique historical baggage to them. Two of my players picked their races. So one went tiefling, one went dragonborn. I feel almost largely in part because of the history and the baggage associated with those people because it would make for a very interesting, I hoped, uh, I still hope, role playing and space for, for growth and what that means for a person to be from this background, this place, these people that have been through all this in their life. This is good for advice for DMs as well. When you're creating a world, think about what it means to be a dwarf in this world, what it means to be an orc, what it means to be an elf. And you by no means have to get into like racial prejudice and stereotypes and everything because that is a very dangerous line to toe a lot of the times, especially if you are someone, if you are a white person and you are <laughs> telling a story where racism features heavily, this is a very mm, area and it's an area that I've fallen into myself and I'm like, that may have been a mistake, probably was a mistake. But regardless of anything, people have a history. People, if I tend to think of uh, race and Dungeons and Dragons like being societies within our own world. Someone living in Britain has a very different history to someone living in China. These are very different people and their histories are very different. We take Middle Earth as an example. If you are someone who was born and raised in Gondor during the Third Age, you are someone who's been living constantly under the shadow of, of Mordor. Your capital is a ruin. Your steward, the man to be in charge of your country, is going increasingly insane. And you are constantly reminded of this glorious before time of uh, heroism and might and valor in your people. And that tells you a lot about a person. Someone who grows up in that kind of environment is going to be different to a hobbit. Very different histories, different factors informing their upbringing. Now, a lot of what I've said so far doesn't necessarily have to just apply to race. There has been a very uh, deserving upkick recently in the RPG community about wanting to rebrand 
redesign how race is handled in especially games like Dungeons and Dragons because it's a very archaic and very insensitive um, and borderline racist in some places way of things being done of different people have being you if you are a dwarf you are like this and it doesn't leave a lot of, of room to grow within it um, so what you can do as well if you're making especially in homebrew worlds is if we take carry on with the middle earth example humans and dwarves lived and created a, a society together in Erebor. Uh, Erebor and Dale worked together, they were one people essentially, like you had, sure, you had the dwarves in the Lonely Mountain and the humans in Dale, but when Smaug came and destroyed everything it was a traumatic historical event for both people. If you wanted to be from that area and someone who suffered Smaug's attack uh, on the Lonely Mountain you can be a human or dwarf you can still have essentially the same backstory and then it just comes down to which you prefer to be out of the two however how they are presented in rules of written D&D, there are very clear mechanical differences between the races and that can inform largely how you choose what is your character's relationship with magic do they have a innate magical power that is present in races like elves and halflings and just this magic has always been a part of you or are you from a race that doesn't have anything that's like innate magical properties like humans and so you've had to scrap and um, save and figure out magic entirely on your own. That's why I love humans as wizards because it is the ultimate fuck you to these like um, innate magical beings. They're like, I am just as powerful if not potentially more powerful than you and it's all off my own back, all off what I have been doing uh, throughout my life rather than it coming from a position of, of magical privilege. The final thing to think of when establishing a character from the ground up is what kind of person do you want to be in this campaign? A lot of campaigns go on for months, if not years. I am into my second year on three campaigns. And if I, I've been very different people in uh, lots of campaigns and it is something you very much have to Figure out if this is something you can keep up. If this is something that you surround it all, like your character will change and grow. There's gonna be a certain base essence to your character and you need to make sure that that is something that you are willing to put yourself through on a regular basis. Do you want to be this uh, beacon of hope and light force of good who's constantly pushing back against the darkness no matter how many times it beats you back down because it's the right thing to do? Or are you this scorned and bitter individual who has been wronged by society and life so many times that you have just turned this, this twisted need for revenge within you now that is going to end up potentially consuming your character? Or do you just want to be a lovable himbo? Because that's also wonderful and valid and I love, love gold-hearted idiots in the campaign. A lot of what comes down to sort of the kind of person you want to play can vary wildly depending on the campaign. A lot of campaigns, especially pre-written ones, will come with a sort of thematic point that you are generally advised to tie your character to. Curse of Strahd is a very good example of this. Curse of Strahd is a very dark, heavy, horror campaign. And so the when you're creating your character for this kind of campaign, you need to look at it and think, okay, how does this person relate to this setting? You need to, with all these, with the themes that are present, I always say that you need to make someone who leans into the story. With Curse Strahd's fantastic example, you can play a character who is dark and uh, sort of really leans into all the, the dark gothic horror vibe, or, or you can make someone who stands in opposition of it all, but it is clear that they are you work in tandem in relation to the setting rather than being someone who is, exists contrary to it, uh, who doesn't want to engage. That's why I'm a very big supporter of creating a character fresh for a campaign as opposed to uh, taking characters that you already have and then trying to fit them in. I understand the desire to use characters that perhaps were in a campaign that unfortunately fizzled out or never got started in the first place. And I am in a position of uh, privilege here in terms of being a DM as I can take all these characters that I have or have been able to use and make them NPCs. And that works just as well because I still get to play them. 
but for, for me, so much about a character is rooted in where they grew up and where they've come from. Their past experiences shapes them into who they are now, and also the campaign setting. There have been times, like as a DM, where like this character just doesn't gel with the story I'm trying to tell, with the themes that are in place, and sometimes that can work. But it is a very fine line to walk, and I think making sure to have that kind of open discussion with your DM and figure out what kind of characters you should be making. This is the power of session zeros, I think, or even pre-session zeros, figuring out characters. The DM should give you a very clear idea of what kind of person, what kind of things you're going to be dealing with, and so you can make a character that has those themes and concepts at their heart. But of course, you don't have to do things like this. You don't have to do this sort of, uh, oh, what kind of, what race do I want to play? What class do I want to be? What background do I want to have? If you are watching a film or reading a book or playing a game or listening, uh, watching another like D&D podcast or, or live show and you see a character, you are like, that, I want to be that, then fucking go for it, you funky little D&D player. Why am I gone Australian? Because having sort of a character that is like a pre-established being and has these pre-established tropes and structure given to them is such a good springboard starting point for character creation. And it's very helpful for the DM to know, oh, this is okay, this is the kind of person you want to be. All right, I, I have that clear example there of what kind of vibe you're going for. This can apply to the whole concept of a character, or you can pick and choose elements. Do you want to play someone with the the background and the aesthetic of Han Solo, but the like personality and physicality of Princess Leia? And, oh god, that might be the best character idea that I've ever had. Or do you want to be the crotchety old wizard side of Gandalf, but with the aesthetic of your, like, cool older cousin? Using these characters as a solid foundation is a great way to start. And even if you did just turn up to a game with a carbon copy of Aragorn, son of Arathorn, heir to Elendil and Isildur, where that character goes is going to be wildly different because your campaign won't be Lord of the Rings. Because you won't always make the same choices that Tolkien had Aragorn make because you are a different person and this is an improvised, um, unplanned storytelling. And so things are always going to be different. The entire experience is volatile. I think if you ran a campaign that had everyone playing members of the Fellowship, and you started them off at the exact same point. If you started them off, okay, everything up until now has been exactly the same. Up until Rivendell has been exactly the same that happens in the in the films or the or the books. And then you set them off from Rivendell. The story would be incredibly different from Lord of the Rings because that's just how DD is, and it's wonderful. And it means you should never be worried about this comes to both players and DM, never be worried about taking things from other media because it's always going to end up different because you are different artists working on it and in wildly different mediums as well. This video is shaping up to be a lot longer than I thought it was. Looking at the script, I am not even halfway through yet. So this is going to be split over two videos and part two is going to cover character voices as well as random tables and character question airs. I hope this part one has been helpful for you and there will be more coming soon, don't you worry. And I'd like to take this opportunity at the end of part one to thank my patrons, Raven Ranger, Mike Duller and Francesca Forrest. If you would like to become a patron and get access to exclusive content and regular YouTube content before anyone else, please consider heading over on the link in the doobly-doo and become a patron today. Thank you all for watching. I hope this was helpful and have a good day.